excited. Welcome to week one of this new series that we have titled, You've Got Questions, He's Got Answers. Come on, look at your neighbor and tell him he's got answers. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. And with the same enthusiasm, come on, help me welcome all of our friends and loved ones that are following us and viewing us around the world. So cool to be able to reach every one of you. Thank you for tuning in. And if you're ever around this region in New England, please come out and check us out. I promise you it's just as fun when you are here. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, let's do this. Let us pray and then we'll just jump right into the word. Father, what an awesome time to be alive, to serve you, to be a part of your church. Lord, we take this moment in your presence to just reflect on your goodness, on your grace, on your mercy. And today, God, we prepare our hearts. We lean in to receive from you. Lord, speak to us. Do what you always do. Surprise us. Love on us, oh God. And we pray this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. You may be seated. As I always do, I want to challenge you to open up your RWC Church app so that we can grow together. Grow together. This, for me, is one of the funnest series that I have a chance to communicate every year. This is the second year that we're doing it. Uh, the truth is that we all have questions. We all have questions. If you've lived long enough, there are some questions that you have and uh, that sometimes they'll go unanswered. Matter of fact, I think the older you get, the more complex life becomes, the more questions you have. And I decided that it would be cool if we separated an entire month and we dedicated to ta really tackling some of these questions. Uh, so over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about different stuff, this stuff that's really interesting. Next week, I want to talk to you about purpose. You've often heard the word purpose and uh, what does it mean, Pastor? And uh, if you've been in church long enough or if you've visited a church, you often hear us talk about we're agents of purpose and you need a purpose. And right, this P word sometimes can be pretty intimidating. Um, and I want to challenge you next week. We're going to talk about purpose. We're going to talk about how to deal with difficult people. Anybody know some difficult people here? If you're sitting next to them, don't look at them. Look at me. It's going to be easier. Uh, yeah, we're going to deal with that. We're going to deal with that in a couple of weeks. How do we deal with difficult people? But today, today the question that's on tap is this one. How do I share my faith? How do I share my faith? In an, in an era that it has, it has become harder and harder to share our faith openly, unapologetically, it, it, at one point, it was, um, it was completely a part of our culture and our society, but it's become more and more just kind of um, politically incorrect for us to share our faith. And I want to teach you, I want to teach you today in a very practical way, how do, we, how do we become effective as people that have heard the gospel and feel so excited about hearing the gospel that we want to share it with our friends and sometimes Pastor, how do I do it? I want to help you. But before I do that, let's look at the instruction that Jesus gives us. The Gospel of Mark, the 16th chapter, and the 15th verse, look at what Jesus said. Jesus said to his followers, how many followers of Jesus do we have here today? Shout amen. All right. Look at what he said. This is the instruction. Go everywhere in the world and tell the good news to everyone. Look at the instruction that Jesus gives us. Number one, I need you to go, say it with me, everywhere. And number two, I need you to reach everyone. Which means that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not for a specific race. It's not for a specific class of people. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not reserved for, for just uh, certain nations. No, no, no. Jesus was very intentional, and he sent them to go everywhere and to reach everyone. Here in RWC, we believe 
that we are not a church for church people. We're not. We're not here to reach just the church. We exist to reach those that are lost. We're constantly, you know, we, we bring the net every single week and we want to cast the net to those that don't know about Jesus. So, so if you are here today and you don't know about Jesus or if you're watching us from around the world and you've never heard the good news of Jesus Christ, let me tell you, don't change that tune. You came to the right place at the right time to hear the right word. Come on, somebody. I believe that. I believe that. Now, there are things that we take for granted. If you've been in church long enough, you've come to the realization that the Bible is comprised of 66 books, right? And, and there are chapters and there are verses. So when you look in the Bible, you look up Luke 1 and then you verse 6 and you, you, read, you read it accordingly. But there are people that don't know that that's how things are. So the things that we take for, for granted almost, the things that we've come accustomed to, other people look at it and they said, man, I opened up the Bible the other day and I saw that there was a book dedicated just for jobs. <laughs> and I'm unemployed, so, you know, I decided that I would look there to see if there was some help for me. Well, you, you know, you might find that funny, but there's some people that they don't read it as Job, they read it as a job. So here I am at job 116 and, you know, I'm a... Uh, I'm broke, so I might as well start here, you know. <laughs> so I, I want you to realize that there's still a huge number of people, maybe in your street, maybe at your place of employment, maybe in your, in your neighborhood, in your city, that have yet to hear the good news. And let me tell you something. It was good news 2,000 plus years ago, and it's still good news today. Do you believe that with me? So we exist for those that are lost. Jesus emphasized this. Jesus spoke about the importance of the one. So you and I that are here in church, then you and I are in two positions. Either this position, number one, we are seeking God. We are looking to finding him, right? We're, we're hungry for change. That's the first position that we're in. Or once we have found him, now we want to be a part of God's rescue team to help find those that are lost. So those are the two, own, the two positions that we are in. We are either lost, looking for help, or we have been found, and, and now we want to help those that don't have what we have. Look at what the Bible calls you and I, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. It says we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. Check this out. You are an ambassador of Jesus Christ, which means that you are a legal representation of the kingdom of God, of the government of the Lord. I don't know about you, but that's an amazing honor that God says when he speaks about the church, he says, you guys represent me. Come on, look at two people and tell them you represent God. Oh, yeah, I know. It's a little scary, isn't it? When you think about it that way. Pastor, what do you mean? We are the only Jesus that many people will ever see. I'm going to say that again. We are the only Jesus that many people will ever see. Pastor, what do you mean? There are no plan B's for God. That's it. We are the vehicle. We are the conduit. We are his body. He's not, he's not saying, you know what, let's, let's scratch plan, plan A and let's just decide to reach, other, reach people with other. No, no, no. There's no robots that will be created to, to be able to preach the gospel, to be able to reach the lost. The only plan that God has to reach this entire world is you and I. That's why we need to know how to do this. 
It's not just good enough for us to be found. We need to now become a part of God's rescue team so that we can help those that are still struggling, that are still hungry, that still want the essence, that are still looking for something that is real. They've tried drugs. It didn't work out. They've tried relationships. It hasn't worked out. They've tried all sorts of things, and none of that has worked out. Why? Because man's desire, man's desire, whether they know it or not, is to be in unity with his creator amen so as we embark on this journey today of learning how to share our faith i believe that there are some realities that we must come to terms with and the first reality is that it is not as politically correct today in the 21st century to share the gospel I mean, you go, to, you go to places, even within the United States of America, and it's, it's culturally accepted. You go to the Bible Belt, and, and you tell somebody, good morning, God bless you, man. And you might, you might find somebody that'll, that'll, that'll quote you back with a scripture. You know what I'm saying? Like, you might find somebody at a local diner that is reading the word of God. But, but there are other parts of this country, like New England. Come on, somebody. Where for you, to, for you to decide that you're going to pray before you eat in a public place, people may look at you a little bit awkward. But do it anyways. Amen? Do it anyways. <laughs> do, do it anyways and, and emphasize a little bit in Jesus' name. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> like look to the right to the in Jesus' name. All right? <laughs> It's just, not, it's just not as culturally accepted. So how do we do it? How do we do it? And, and why has this become such an issue? Well, this is what I have found. I have found that in large part, the church has not done, us as Christians, we have not done the best of jobs. I think that we've gotten it wrong for the most part. Pastor, what do you mean? Well, I believe that we, most Christians operate in two extremes. And the first extreme is is, is let's be so secular. Let's be so secular, um, just as secular as the world. And that way, let's be inclusive. Let's be an inclusive people. And, and that's an extreme. Because guess what? You can't make a difference unless you're different. <laughs> I'm going to say that again with a smile. You can't, you can't make a difference unless you're different. So this is an extreme, the extreme that says, you know, we're just going to be so inclusive and we're going to be as secular as the world. Yeah, they party and we party too. Yeah, they get drunk and we get drunk too. That's, that's, that's an extreme. Say it with me, those are extremes. But then there's another extreme. And the other extreme is so dogmatic it's so full of r rules and, and judgment. And the reality is that it's crude and, and rude for people that feel that they have to be the jury, the judge, the executioner. I can't stand that. People that look at you and say, well, you don't seem like a Christian. I don't know. What does a Christian seem like? You know how many times that's happened to me? Well, you don't look like a pastor what I mean, what does a pastor look like i mean does he have a certain weight does he dress a certain way does he talk yes yeah the, the reality is that that's the way that people just kind of they fit you in a little box and if you don't if you don't adhere to the to, to that format and to the model then you're not you're not it that's what the other extreme says Right? That's why we've been talked about. We've been criticized. Trust me, I've been there. So those are extremes. And God does not call us to operate in extremes. God calls us to operate with discernment and great wisdom. So I believe, I believe that we can, we can stand for truth and for it to be attractive. I'm going to say that again. I believe that as the church of Jesus Christ... You and I can stand for truth 
and it could be attractive to the lost. It could be attractive to those that are hungry. In other words, in other words, it could be so attractive that people will say, I want what she has. I want what he has. And that's what I want to teach you. I want to teach you how do we present the gospel in such a way that it, shall, it would be so attractive that everybody would say, man, I want that. I believe we can do it. Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6 gives us some clear instruction. How do we begin to do this? Look at what the Bible says. It says, be wise. Say it with me, be wise. You notice it doesn't say, be loud. You notice it doesn't say, uh, be right all the time. Because if you're the type of Christian that you want to be right all the time, and you want to win every argument, and you're the obnoxious one at work, Look at what the Bible says. It doesn't say to be loud. It doesn't say to, to always want to be right. It says to be wise. But, but it also doesn't say to be silent. Hello? So it says be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most. Say it with me, the most. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always Full of grace. Imagine that. Full of grace. Full of grace. Seasoned with salt. So that you may know how to answer everyone. So let's begin today. How do I share my faith? First Peter chapter 3 verse 15. Look at what the Bible says. It says always. Say it with me always. Do you see the picture that God is teaching us today? It's a, this is not something that I just do sometimes. This is not something that is reserved for the elitist or just for the evangelist. Well, I don't have the call to evangelize. Yes, you do. Hello? Oh, well, you know that's for people that know the word. Well, you're supposed to know the word if you're a disciple. So... Look at, look at what the Bible tells us. It says that we ought to be prepared. Say it with me, preparation. preparation. The reason we can't share our faith is because we are not adequately prepared. Oh, y'all looking at me already crazy. Y'all. Look at what it says. Be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Do you know that there are people that are asking you? It's happened to you already. They see your profile. They see how your social media has been sanctified. <laughs> Wait a minute. I saw you got baptized. I didn't know you baptized your Facebook too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I threw all the ratchetness into the water. So what it does, watch this, watch this. No, 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 I'm, I'm trying to help you because it's happening to you every week. Every single week, people are seeing your profile, they're seeing your demeanor, and they're asking, wait a minute, I saw that every Friday around so-and-so time, you know, I knew that you were going out partying and I would see your post. And, but over the last three months... <laughs> Over the last three months, I've seen that you something else happened. Something changed in your life. What is it? Look at what Peter says. If that is you, if it's happening to you via message, via text, via Snapchat, it doesn't matter how it's happening, but if it's happening to you, Peter says, be prepared to give an answer. To everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. In other words, people are going to ask you, talk to me about why you in church every Sunday. People are going to tell you, what's that midweek you showing up to church on a Wednesday? What's that that you was in the growth track? What's that? All right. And when they do, you've got to be prepared. You've got to have a two-minute presentation. You've got to let them know. 
And don't get all spiritual about it. Just, just tell them, man, I tell, man, where do I start, homie? Where do I start? God has been so good to me. Man, I was so cray-cray. You don't know how many pills I was popping. I was addicted. I could hardly sleep. I was lost. And then somebody decided that, 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 that they would invite me. So they sent me a message. They sent me a message and I ignored the message. I, I literally unfollowed the person. And right, yeah. And they cannot, then they put it in my wall. They put it all up in my wall. I went to a place that you need and you ought to, I know you is ignoring me, but you should come with me. And I decided that I would come check it out. And I came out on Wednesday and this guy started preaching and it was like he was, homie was reading my mail. He was reading my mail and I didn't even give him the password. So then I asked around and I said, man, did somebody give this guy my password? No. It was that this thing called God, this thing called the Holy Spirit that searches. So I've been learning. I've been learning. And can I tell you, it has been the best three months of my life. Come on, somebody. So I want to give you today practical steps. How do I share my faith? Number one, number one. Connect with people. If you are going to be huh, someone who is constantly sharing the good news, you can't do it in the absence of people. You've got to surround yourself with people. There's no such thing as I love God, but I hate people. Hello? There's no such thing that this has been so much to me and it has blessed me so much, but, but I don't want to share it. No, that is an oxymoron. That makes absolutely no sense. If you are going to share your faith, it starts first and foremost with positioning yourself and connecting with people. You cannot correct unless you connect. Hello, somebody. Everybody trying to go around correcting everybody? No. You got to know your role, and you got to slow your role. <laughs> you, you've got to first connect with people. You've got to earn the right to speak into their life. You, you've got to feel that the bridge of honor has been constructed so that you can speak into a need that you know is going to be uncomfortable for them to hear, but because they know you care, they'll actually let you speak into their life. Come on, can we, just, can we just show our gratitude for the person that reached us when we felt like we were beyond reach for the person that connected with us? Come on, somebody. Jesus, watch this. Jesus never compromised truth and yet sinners loved him. In other words, Jesus didn't say, well, if I can't beat him, I might as well join him. <laughs> that was not him. No, 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 no. Jesus never, ever, say it with me, never. He never compromised truth, yet sinners loved him. They absolutely flooded to be with him. Look what the Bible says, Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. He came for the lost. Come on, look at two people and tell them we exist for the lost. Hallelujah. There's no better story of this. I mean, there's just so many, but the one that I wanted to highlight this morning was the story of Zacchaeus. Luke chapter 19, verse 1. I'm going to read a little bit, but check this out. This, is, this is, shows us that Jesus never compromised truth, never, and yet sinners wanted to hang out with him. Church of Jesus Christ, listen to me, RWC, all of my brethren that are listening around the world, don't you for one second think that in order for you to be relevant, you've got to stoop down to someone's level. You don't stoop down to their level. You call them up to your level. Come on, somebody. 
Well, Pastor, I just wanted to evangelize, so I just decided to go clubbing with him Thursday and Friday night. No, you, you weren't evangelizing. You, you were struggling with a spirit that's been leeching on to you. Hello? Ah. Luke 19, 1, look at what the Bible says. He entered Jericho, and he was passing through. And there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. Can I just give you the, 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 the ghetto version? Ghetto version international. The GVI. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Zacchaeus was a tax collector, which means that Zacchaeus was a bad brother. Yeah, he was a bad man. He was, he was, he was stealing from those that were impoverished already. All right, Jesus did not screen him to see if whether or not his association with Zacchaeus would ruin his effectiveness or his reputation. Jesus said, oh yeah, he dirty. He bad. I'm light. Here we go. There was a man by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector. He was very rich. Verse 3. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. The world is looking to see who we are. They, they don't want you to say it. They don't want to hear your story simply. They're looking at you without you even knowing it. That person at work that you can barely stand, and you're the believer, that person is looking at you because they're seeking they're, they're, they're longing for help. And there was Zacchaeus. He was, he was looking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small of stature. So he ran ahead. He ran for his life. <laughs> and he climbed into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. Verse 5, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I may stay, I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. That is the type of church that Jesus is lifting up in the 21st century. A church that is not intimidated by somebody's record, by somebody's resume, by somebody's poor reputation, but a church that will go out of the way to reach the Zacchaeus of this world that are down and out, that are chief sinners, that are effective at sinning. They got their PhD at sinning, but yet they are hungry. They've put their trust in all the wrong places. Places, but the church that God is lifting up is saying, I will go. Hallelujah. So there is, there is Jesus. He appears and he tells Zacchaeus, hurry, come down for I'm going to stay at your house today. And I love the response of Zacchaeus. And I believe that this will be the response of our friends, of our loved ones of our colleagues at work, of our classmates in school, the Bible says that Zacchaeus hurried and he came down and he received him joyfully. Can I tell you that the world does not need another religion? The world does not need another church service. The world does not need another event. What the world needs is for the church to rise up and go out of the way and decide that we not only go into church, but we're going to be the church and we are going to be the difference that this world needs. I believe that wholeheartedly. In other words, people don't want to see what you know. They want to see who you are. They don't, they don't care to hear your eloquence. They don't care how much you know of the Hebrew and the Greek if you ain't nice in English. Yeah. They, they don't care how many books you've read and how many and, and what they mean and all the stuff, all the studying you've done. They don't care about none of that. What they do care about is, is who you are. 
are there fruits? Is there a remnant of godliness, of joy in your life? I believe that when you love people where they're at, it opens up a gateway to their heart. I'm going to say that again. I believe that when you love people where they're at, not because you're hoping for them to change. No, 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 no. You're going to love them where they are. I don't love everything about you, but I love you right now where you are. And when you love them where they are, it opens up a portal, a gateway to their heart so that you can speak into them. All of us, whether we believe this, whether we know it, whether we acknowledge it, all of us were on the opposite side of someone who chose to love us even when they saw parts of us that we didn't even like ourselves. And yet they still made an active choice to invest time, energy, resources, words of encouragement to let you know that everything was going to be okay. Come on, I'm preaching better than you're responding this morning. So look at what happened. Look at what happened, Luke 19, 7. Look at what happened, and when they saw it, yeah, when the crowd saw it, they all grumbled, and look at what they said. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. You're always going to have some Ashdodites. Remember last week's teaching? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're always going to have some haters that are going to talk, and they're going to say, look at him. Look at him. Can I tell you, I want to be criticized the way, for, for the reason Jesus was criticized. You know what I want them to say about me? Man, look at that guy. He's always with sinners. Duh. There he goes again, preaching the gospel to a sinner. Duh. Keep on talking about me. And there they go again, reaching the lost. Come on, keep on saying it. I want to be criticized for the same reasons that Jesus was talked about, criticized. <laughs> and when all this is happening, when all the grumbling is happening, the Bible says that Zacchaeus stood up, verse 8, and he said to the Lord, Behold, Lord. The half of my goods I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will restore it fourfold. In other words, I'm going to give, give back four times as much as everything that I have stolen. I love what happens to chief sinners who get, who get really, really sideswapped by the grace of God. You know what happens to them? They don't think of it twice to give. They don't think about it twice to serve. They don't think about, I want to be a part of this. You kidding me? I lived my whole life stealing. That's what Zacchaeus is saying. I lived my whole life defrauding men and women of their money. Now that I have been saved by Jesus, I couldn't reach him, but he reached me. I was short in stature, which means that I had not hit the mark, but yet he came out of his way. He looked at me and he said, I'm going to go to your house. You kidding me? I'm going to do what I can do and some. I love what happens when a passionate sinner, <laughs> well versed in sinning, experienced and very effective at it, decides to answer the call to follow Jesus. What I've learned in my life that those people are the most committed. Those people, they consider the cost and they say, you kidding me? Man, I used to be high. I used to be sleeping in the streets. You kidding me, Pastor? I get to now come and set up and break down and be a part of what God is doing in a church. Are you kidding me? You don't have to tell me twice, Pastor. Where do I go? Where do you want me to move? What do you want me to conquer? What city are we taking over next? Pastor, just say it. I'll run with it. Those are the kind of, man, I'm, I'm looking to have a church that is full of Zacchaeus and Rahab's Jacob's people that were shortcomings, full of shortcomings, but they were reached by the amazing grace and the power of God's love. Come on, somebody, if you believe that. Give me a good amen. Come on, hallelujah. Number two, how do I share my faith? Not only are you going to connect with people, but number two, you're going to share your story with people. That's right, share your story. Don't tell people what they need to change. That's right. Don't tell them, well, I think you're doing that. Share your story. 
Let them know what God has done in your life. Look at what the Bible says in Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. You notice there that it didn't say you shall be my judge. You notice there it didn't say you shall be my jury. Isn't it amazing that in a, in a court of law, you have a judge, you have a jury, you have a lawyer, right? And then the judge, he gives the, the sentence, he executes the sentence in accordance to the laws and to the mandates that have been previously established. But then there is this position that is held for the, for, the, for, for, for the freedom and for the opportunity of the plaintiff. And that is the witness. If, if you, see, if you think about this, I, I, love, I, I love all those shows. I really do. My mom used to tell me, you would make a good lawyer. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why, but yeah. maybe I do. But, but one thing I do know is that when the Bible says that you shall be witnesses, think about what a witness does. The witness will sit in the witness stand and the lawyer will begin to ask questions. Tell me a little bit about yourself. And, and that, is, that is the picture of our position in the Lord. We are not called to be judged. We are not called to be the jury. We are not called to execute anything. All we are called to do is to be a witness. And you know who's the lawyer? Jesus. So then we, we sit there, we sit there and we say, well, you know, um, well, this is my story. And you begin to share what happened you begin to share your vantage point of what it has meant to you and what you have experienced. Notice that the witness can't say, well, I think. No, 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 it's not about you thinking. It's about what you experience. Hello? And if we are going to share the good news of Jesus Christ, and if we are going to save the lost, we've got to share our personal stories. We, we've got to let them know what God has done in our life. This is my story. It's my story. And, and, and learn how to do it, like I said earlier, in under two minutes. Now, my story is very simple. Born and raised in the church. And yet, I was far from God. I knew how to do church, but I didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Good Friday, I was a young kid at the age of nine. My pastor was preaching, and I had a supernatural experience with God. I knew that I was a sinner. Don't ask me how. I just knew at that age that, that something was different. And I accepted the Lord, but I didn't know what that meant. And I started this journey, and I, and I got tired of, of, of seeing that, that things were different from what I saw in Scripture. So then my prayer to God began to change and say, God, there has to be more and more and more and more and more. So that's what we, when we talk about RWC, can I tell you that RWC is the product of a prayer that I prayed in my wife years ago that started off with, God, there has to be more. That's my story. My story. What's yours? What has God done in your life? Number three, number three. How else do I share my faith? Number three, invite them to a place where they can experience God. Invite them. God is not to be understood. God is to be experienced. I'm going to say that again. God is not to simply be understood. God must be experienced. I have had many people tell me their testimony of being skeptical. Many of them. Pastor, I came in and I was a little bit, you know. <laughs> I just sat down and I started hearing the word and I just, I could not deny what I was feeling. 
I've had people tell me, Pastor, from the time that I came in in the parking lot and I was greeted the first time, I just, I don't know why, but I got so emotional. And then I came into the lobby and I, three or four hugs later, and I got even more emotional. By the time I sat down and, and they started the worship songs and, and I'm just here, right, what are these people on? And then without even noticing, I started to cry and I couldn't contain myself, Pastor. What is it? And I was skeptical the whole way and then I heard you preach, Pastor, and I thought, what can this young man teach me? But you started talking and Pastor, I was just, my heart was turned. I started and then before you know it, I lifted up my hands and I said, I want Jesus too. Invite them. Invite them to a place where they can experience God. Invite them. Bring them. Challenge them that there's more to life than working 9 to 5 or 4 to 10 or 12 to 6. There's more to life than just, than just seeing and having kids and being married. All that stuff is beautiful. There's more to life than the picket fence in the White House. No, there's more to life than that. There's an answer to, to man's most inner, most inner questions about eternity, about belonging, about acceptance, about purpose. And that answer is only found through Jesus Christ. I love Paul's story. Let us observe Paul's testimony. It's pretty cool. Yeah, Paul's testimony is pretty riveting. And look at what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. I'm going to read this from the Message Bible because you know me. I just like to keep it very simple. Look at what it says. You'll remember, friends, that when I first came to you to let you in on God's master stroke, I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophy. I deliberately kept it plain and simple. First, Jesus and who he is, then Jesus and what he did. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> Jesus crucified. I was unsure of how to go about this and felt totally inadequate. I was scared to death. Does that sound like you when you're trying to witness to somebody? That sound like you try to open up your mouth like, oh my goodness. But let's go to the book of Job chapter 2 verse... <laughs> I felt totally inadequate. I was scared to death. Sounds a little bit like me before I get, have to preach sometimes. Man, I, sometimes I'm going to talk about stuff. I'm like, Ugh. right? Yeah, it happens. Totally inadequate. I was scared to death. If you want the truth of it, and so nothing I said could have impressed you or anyone else. But the message came through anyway. God's spirit and God's power did it. Which made it clear that your life of faith is a response of, to God's power, not to some fancy, mental, or emotional footwork by me or anyone else. <laughs> Woo! Let me break this down in the, in the ghetto version international. If I can. You know, there are times that I'm preaching and people will come, you know, I, I, I'll be done preaching and I'll say to myself, man, I tank. That was terrible. I, I just, I just, because, because, you know, as a communicator, I, 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 you know, you live and die by the effectiveness of your communication. And so, so I, I'll just hear it and I'm like, oh my God, I stumbled upon my words and, uh, I, I was just so redundant and I just, uh. And then that's the week that 17 people will come to me and tell me, Pastor, that word that you brought on Sunday. <laughs> that was so perfect. That was like right now. And I'm thinking to myself, really? So I could relate when Paul says, I spoke and it was so inadequate. I spoke, and I, and I couldn't, I really couldn't even hit a, a bunt, let alone a single. I mean, my offense was like the New York Yankees against the Red Sox. That's how. Or like the Red Sox against the Astros last night. However you, my offense was just, 
I couldn't do it. This is what Paul is saying. I couldn't do it. I was scared. I didn't know how to do it. But the message came through anyway. Why? Why? Because it's God's spirit. It's God's power which makes it clear to your life. So then your life is then a response not to my words. Your life is a response to the power of God. Woo! Our life is a response to the power of God, which means that's why the Bible says in the beginning, the word was with God and the word was God. John chapter 1 verse 1, read it. Why? Because there is power in the name of Jesus. If you want to hear from God, just open up the book. If you want a prophecy from scripture, just open up the book. If you want God to reveal himself, just open up the book. His word is alive and well, as powerful as it was 2,000 years ago. It's still powerful here today in Springfield, Massachusetts. Yes, it is. It's power. It's power. So then, we invite them. I say all this to tell you that this world is grieving and this world is hurting. I say all this to tell you that the world that we live in today is a world that has the wrong picture of God. Mark chapter 8, verse 27 and 29. I'm getting ready to close. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? And they replied, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. And still others, one of the prophets. But then Jesus said, what about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you're the Christ. You're the Christ. I want to close today by letting you know that people see God in one of these ways. Number one, they see God as unavailable. Pastor, what do you mean? This world that we live in sees God as unavailable. In other words, God can't be reached. Acts chapter 17, verse 27, he doesn't play hide and seek with us. He is not remote. He is near. That's the God that you and I serve. Other people, number two, they see God as a drill sergeant. Yeah, yeah, like a drill sergeant. And if you were in the military, you know what this means. Because the drill sergeant is not supposed to be nice. And some people, they see God and they're afraid of God. I'm not talking about reverence. I'm talking about straight up afraid of God. And somehow, some way, you feel like God does not want you, like God does not need you, like God is, is completely overlooked you. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but to do, I remind you, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And then other people, they, they see God, number three, as out of reach, out of reach. An endless ladder. Like I keep on climbing, I keep on climbing, I keep on climbing, but I ain't getting anywhere, Pastor. And he, I've been at this, Pastor. You told me to give you a year. Here I am. I'm at this a year, but I'm dealing with more problems and more situations and more struggles and more hardships, Pastor. And, and you see him as an endless ladder, as completely out of touch. Or God is requiring way too much from me. Like it's, it's all about works. And, and I feel drained, Pastor. John 6, verse 28 and 29. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So my number, job, not my number, one, my number one responsibility in the kingdom is to believe. And then number four, other people see this, see God the right way. Other people see God as a good, good father. A good father. A good father that shows us the true picture of God. 
Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not for yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you, church. Pastor, what do you mean? He will never love you more than he loves you right now. His, not, his love for you is not progressive. His love for you is perfect. Nothing that you can do for him. All you need to do is just accept him. Accept him. So when we sing, It's your good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Because you're a good, good, good father. That's, that's a picture of God that he wants you to see, church. He's not a drill sergeant. He's not out of touch. He's not unavailable. You call upon him, he answers. He is a strong tower. He is your faithful friend. He is the father of the fatherless. He is the father of those that are desperate and broken. He's not intimidated by your sin. He's not intimidated by your record. He's not intimidated by your past. He is a good, 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 good father. And if you have received his love, I want you to stand upon your feet and give him praise this morning. I'm loved by you. I'm loved by you. He's a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are.